Now today's program is entitled Congenital Tooth Defects, Diagnosis, Management, and Clinical Treatment. And just so you're aware of how the format's going to go, we have four speakers this afternoon. Each of them will talk on the topic from their unique perspective. And to keep the program moving along, we're going to ask that all questions take place during our panel discussion with all four uh, speakers here at the end of the afternoon. And then following that panel discussion, we invite you all to join us for a reception in our lobby before our alumni guests have to catch the bus back over to the, the dinners at the hotel tonight. Now at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Bradley, a professor in the Bio Department of Biologic Materials, who is our host for this afternoon's program. And I'd like to bring him to the program now. Well, welcome all of you. As, as you saw from the previous slide, um, the Department of Biological Material Sciences is hosting uh, this particular Grand Rounds. And I'm here to welcome you all and, and to say that the, we, are, we are so pleased that we've been able to do this. And now I'm going to hand over from, uh, from me to Jan Hugh, who is going to continue the introduction of the first speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Jan Hu, professor in the Department of Biologic and Material Sciences. Um, so the first guest speaker is Dr. Tom Hart. Dr. Tom Hart is the leading authority on the genetics of craniofacial defects from 2003 to 2010. He was the clinical director and chief of human cranial facial genetics section at National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research. He's currently professor and director of craniofacial population sciences research at the College of Dentistry at University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Hart received his DDS training from Emory University with certificates in general practice residency and in periodontology from University of Virginia. His PhD in human genetics was from Medical College of Virginia. Dr. Hart has lectured extensively on genetic causes of dental diseases. His over 150 peer review publications have greatly advanced our understanding of the genetic causes of inherited craniofacial and dental defects. So please welcome Dr. Hart. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the co-directors of the course and the dental school for the invitation to come and speak to you about a topic that I actually feel quite passionate about. And I want to also thank Dr. Polverini for the wonderful dinner last night and the discussions. What I would like to do is, uh, by way of overview, just talk to you a little bit about genetics and how I think genetics has influenced my research and also I think is influencing the field, specifically the translation of uh, clinical research into clinical practice. To do that, I'm going to overview a little perspective of genetics, I'm going to talk a little bit about enamel and dentin defects, and really from the clinical perspective as I see now and going forward. Uh, Jim Simmer is going to talk more about mechanistic uh, biology of these defects. Then I want to talk a little bit about, have a think session about clinical implications. And I'm talking about the future of how we're going to integrate genetics into clinical care. And to do that, I'm going to review a little bit of the different types of genetic diseases, just very broadly, and how genetic factors contribute to disease, because I think that understanding is really important to understand or, or try and uh, see where the future is going. Now, with that said, Nowadays, I think it's not a rash statement to say the ideologic basis of most human diseases can be defined in terms of or due to gene-gene and or gene-environment interactions. And in fact, this whole concept, which was really a little more radical at its time in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, when the Human Genome Project was conceived, but this idea that genetics underlies diseases was a fundamental driving force to the Human Genome Project. And the idea was that if genetics are important, you need to identify the genes responsible, clone them out to figure out how they function to develop better diagnostic and treatment-based ideologies. And at the time, I'll remind you, genetics was done in small labs like cottage industries around the world, very slow, very expensive, not real productive. 
At the time, our thoughts of genetics was really somewhat gene-centric in that we were looking where the field was focused more. Most people were focused on mutations or genetic variants of coding genes and proteins. Now, the Human Genome Project was actually, I, I think, the, the culmination in some ways of a number of important discoveries in genetics, and I realize in the back you may not be able to see this, but earlier fundamentals, the rediscovery of Mendel's law, uh, the elucidation of the structure of DNA, which was actually a collaborative effort, identifying how to sequence genes and how to identify, uh, how to sequence DNA and how to identify genetic markers really was a necessary preamble to the Human Genome Project. But the project itself, I'm gonna state, was the first big science initiative. And again, as I said, and I think we need to remember, the impetus for the Human Genome Project was really a clinical driving uh, force. But it really led to the industrialization of science. And by that, I mean the development of new information systems, new technologies, which continues to advance at a tremendous rate even today. When the Human Genome Project was begun, the technologies to complete the project didn't exist. But they were successfully developed. And an important factor is outside of wartime efforts, you really didn't have global industries with large R&D budgets, academics in different institutions, different countries, governments, and private industry all participating towards a common goal. So I'd say this was, in many ways, the first big science, particularly the first big science biology project. And as a result, your tax, pay, your tax dollars are actually contributing to a number of big science projects. And some of them are listed here. There's a website. You can find more information about these. But some of these are really changing the way not only that we perform research, but our understanding of uh, science and biology. And I'm going to mention a little later the results last month of three projects, deep sequencing projects, genome-wide association studies, and the ENCODE project, which have actually fundamentally changed, in my opinion, our concept of genetics of uh, complex diseases. And as a geneticist, I'd say the September results of the ENCODE data is the most fundamental change in genetics since I've been in the field in 25 years. As a result of these big science projects, the way we study human diseases is changing dramatically. We, in addition to studying human cells, we study different animal organisms, mice, zebrafish, the fruit fly, and we have high throughput uh, technologies to producing data. So with this, the emphasis is on translation, you know, how, what have you done for me lately clinically type of thing, but also we need to consider how genetic factors contribute uh, to the diagnosis and treatment of diseases, and I'm going to end up talking more about that. So what, what's the value of understanding the genetic basis of a disease? And while some of this is intuitive or obvious, other, other aspects of this I think we need to consider a bit. To, understanding the genetics of a disease, gene contributions, really helps us understand ideology. Okay. But then what can that help us do? And I think this is important. Understanding the ideology of disease helps us determine the classification of the nosology of diseases. And you'll see that today when we talk about amelogenesis imperfecta. Clinically, we talk about AI. But ideologically, that's due to many different, there's many different ideologic forms. Different gene mutations cause that. And that's important because with that identified, you can then diagnose people with specific forms of the disease. And importantly, if you can then group those people together, instead of a one-size-all treatment, you can start to, uh, to develop treatments that are based on the specific ideology of that condition. And I think that's really critical. And what we're talking about here is really personalized health care. Ultimate goal is to develop a proactive or preventative healthcare system. But the ability to do that, we're still a, a way away from. And in terms of personalized healthcare, I mentioned those big science projects. They've really, their findings published last month have really changed uh, how we're going to go about this, I believe. Now, you may or may not be aware that there's over 8,000 inherited human disorders. In fact, there's more than 3,500 Mendelian disorders, meaning a single gene can cause them. 30 to 40 percent of them involve some oral, dental, or craniofacial phenotype. And in fact, for uh, genetic defects and syndromes, I think the most common manifestation may be mid-face hypoplasia. But some of these diseases affect just the teeth, as in AI, just enamel defects, or just the dentin. Others affect just the gingiva. And then others have more pleomorphic effects affecting multiple tissues. And in some cases, these are all totally unrelated individuals. In some cases, they drive development uh, in a profound way. 
Now, this was an important aspect of my early work when I was a PhD student. There were just the technologies were developed that you could map genes from Mendelian defects with, uh, you know, with DNA from uh, in family pedigrees. And it was theoretically possible. It was just beginning to, uh, to be practically performed. Now, I'm going to talk about two conditions, amelogenesis imperfecta and dentinogenesis imperfecta. And I'm going to speak about those and put them in perspective of how genetics helps us understand ideology, diagnosis, and treatment. So that's the theme I want to develop as I go through the, the talk this, this afternoon. AI, as you're aware, affects development of the enamel. So it's an abnormal development of the enamel. The underlying dentin is normal, but radiographically, what's shown here is the, the enamel layer, radiopaque, and then it's not shown in these teeth, which are affected by AI. Now, clinically, AI has been described for many, many, many years. And clinically, there's four general types and 14 subtypes that consider a number of variables, including pattern of inheritance. And I, I've always found these are very confusing. And while you can find certain individuals that it's easy to classify into one of these four subtypes, clinically, it's really, it becomes problematic in many, many cases. People just don't fit into any of these. Uh, this is a problem for you know, clinical diagnostics, and it's not unique to dentistry. Uh, dermatology, the field of dermatology went through, has gone through a similar type of thing. The problem is that clinical diseases were identified and described long before we had the ability to identify the ideologic underpinnings. So they're imprecise. And what's developing now is using, incorporating in the genetics to develop better nosologies. Now, the prevalence of AI varies in different parts of the world dramatically. And as I mentioned, it can be inherited in a number of different manners. It's X-linked, autosomal dominant, or autosomal recessive, Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Now, when you have a disease that's genetic, you think there's a genetic basis based on fa familial findings, for instance. This is an ideogram showing chromosomes. So the challenge is, if you have a family segregating the disease, initially, which gene is responsible? Where is the gene located? Before we had maps of the genome or the ability to sequence as we do nowadays. So what was performed is sometimes called reverse genetics. And basically, the methodology involves gathering families phenotyping who is and who is not affected. And that's critical and sometimes overlooked the importance of that careful phenotyping. And that's where the role of good clinicians is really critical. But phenotyping who is and not affected, extracting DNA, and then genotyping them, uh, no matter what the genetic markers. You know, we talk about genetic fingerprinting, and you see in all the forensic shows, but all genetic fingerprinting was all developed for gene mapping. The forensics usually follows uh, the development of genotyping techniques that have been employed for mapping genes. So what's done is you uh, sequence or genotype individuals for different genetic polymorphisms and then try and determine which polymorphisms segregate through families with a particular genotype. And there's mathematical algorithms that you can apply or are applied. And with that, you can use that information to localize the causative gene for a disorder to a chromosomal location. You don't need to know anything about the gene involved. This technique just allows you to localize the gene. And nowadays, you can just look in and see what genes are in that genetic interval. You know, it's on uh, databases. Before it was on databases, you used to have to determine what genes were in the interval. And then you sequence, theoretically, sequence through the candidate genes until you identify a genetic alteration that seems like it would be responsible for the gene defect. OK, so that's the general approach. And this approach has been used to identify the genes for many of the 3,500 Mendelian conditions that are reported to date. For AI, these are just uh, some of them. There's a few more uh, recessive forms that have been identified more recently. But what you can see here is, for instance, for autosomal recessive AI, mutations of multiple different genes can cause that disease. Clinically, they may look the same or overlapping, OK? But the gene for these are very different. The ENAM gene is on chromosome 4. MMP20 is on chromosome 11. They're totally different genes. 
What that's helping is, first of all, is to start to establish the nosology. And as I mentioned before, there's a parallel with dermatologic conditions that looked very similar. Part of the difficulty was how to ascribe a di correct diagnosis. As the genetic ideology of dermatologic conditions was, was established, and this was really over the last 20 years, and then treatments were developed based on specific ideologies, the diagnosis and treatment of the field advanced dramatically. And I think that's what we're experiencing or will be experiencing in dentistry. A lot of work to be done, but that's the direction we're going at. Now, Jim Simmer's going to talk about some of these specific mutations and their effects. I'm going to talk just an overview about some of the genotype-phenotype correlations. And what I mean by that is when you identify, well, how, that, uh, how clinicians can have a role in the importance of developing these genotype-phenotype correlations. This uh, slide dates me. This is a book from when I was a dental student. And I just want to illustrate, when I was a dental student, without these names of these protease, proteinases here, this is how I was taught tooth development. You know, there's not too much specific going on here. You know, that was really, you know, getting tested on that. I'm trying to think, how did they write exam questions? But one thing, with understanding the genetic ideology, we can then identify what the players are and understand the pathways that are in normal growth and development and in abnormal growth and development. Very critical. Now, for enamelin mutations, there are mutations, depending on the type of mutation, can cause either autosomal recessive AI or autosomal dominant AI. So just knowing the gene doesn't tell you actually how the disease is going to manifest. Now, enamelin is the most abundant protein in the enamel matrix of developing teeth. And I'm going to illustrate here, this is a case uh, from families in Turkey with AI, independent families. We did linkage analysis, localized the gene to chromosome 4, did mutation analysis, and identified the same gene mutation in probands affected individuals from different, not believed to be related, families. Since a two base pair insertion, you know, the triplet codon for DNA coding would cause a frame shift and change the resultant protein, sometimes creating a, 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 a premature stop codon. And that's what happens here. So you have a truncated protein that's not functional. And what we found in examining individuals and their families, you found individuals who had no copy of the mutation, individuals who carried one copy of the mutation, for instance, the parents were each carriers, and then affected individuals had two copies of the mutation. And these are the three, three of the probands from unrelated families from distant, well, we thought unrelated, from different parts of Turkey. So they look, in a sense, they have a skeletal open bite, melogenesis imperfecta, OK? Two copies of the enamelin mutation. When we did other studies of surrounding DNA, it turned out that these individuals were all related, distantly related. So they had back in their ancestry all inherited a common mutation from a common ancestor, uh, which is a founder effect. But what we also noted with some of the individuals, what they had enamel pitting. And we're interested in enamel pitting because in the anthropology literature, enamel pitting and of, dent of teeth is, is in many cases taken as uh, environmental challenge, insult, uh, fever, illness, or dietary restriction. And I think actually what we're seeing here is there's a genetic basis for this independent of those other factors, that for some people that would be normal development. So we have this enamel pitting, sort of striking enamel pitting. And we look back at our families. What we see here, these are a family pedigree. This is showing two carrier individuals, parents. This is an affected individual that has two copies of that enamel mutation. This is a sibling with one copy of the enamel mutation. And these other individuals who have no copies. These bars just represent individuals who we phenotyped and did a DNA analysis on. And what we found here was the individuals with two copies of the enamel mutation had the full phenotype, if you like, skeletal open bite, melogenesis imperfecta. But the individuals who all carried one copy of the mutation all had this enamel pitting. So with this information, we're starting to develop a more comprehensive, first of all, genotype-phenotype relationship. We have some, ask, some increased understanding of how this gene may function. And we have a gene, gene dosage effect, whereas you have two copies of the mutation, the full-blown phenotype, one copy, a much milder phenotype. 
I want to also mention that there's the, the most common form of autosomal dominant amelogenesis seen in the USA can have a variable expression, but is due to FAM81, uh, FAM83H mutations. These are some of the mutations we found in Turkish and American families. And the implication here is although we still don't understand the gene function, how this functions, it does have implications for genetic testing. Uh, I used to uh, practice and work in New York, and the state of New York has a policy where there's money reserved to help people pay for dental genetic conditions. So you have a genetic condition, AIDI, of genetic origin, there was a reservoir of money to help you. And for those who are familiar, uh, as a periodontist, it was an eye-opener to me seeing some of these patients, the cost of treating AI or DI can be the order of twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You know, so it's not insignificant. I had a case, I had a patient uh, came in and he had two daughters with AI and I said to him, you know, Bill, how are the girls doing? And he said, well, I'm getting ready, uh, they're getting ready to graduate. And I said, are they going to college? And he said, no, Tom, I'm putting the money into getting their teeth fixed uh, rather than sending them to school. And I felt as a parent myself, that was just a, a you know, tragic thing to hear. So it has real implications. But the point I'm trying to make is while the money was there, previously you couldn't prove they had a genetic mutation, okay? So you couldn't access the care dollars. So there, there are some real clinical implications here. I don't know how it is in this state. Now there's other uh, effects for the amelogenin gene on chromosome X. You may have a phenomenon called lionization, which is inactivation of the X chromosome, and it's a random inactivation. So I put this here, so if you're looking at an individual and then getting information about other family members in terms of uh, their teeth and specifically to see if they have AI, males can be much more severely affected than females who can have uh, inactivation of the chromosome that carries that gene mutation. So you may see this variable expression even segregating through a family. Now having said that, I want to make the point that I touched on earlier is that while clinicians, dentists are not necessarily experts in genetics, and there's a lot to learn, although it's a constantly changing and evolving field, you are experts in phenotype. And there's a great need for your expertise. Uh, I think that when you see conditions that are a little out of the normal, you will, you will be able to identify them. And I'd encourage you to delve into those a little deeper. Either work with others, you've got you know, Jim Simmer, Jan Hugh here, and others who do genetics, but you've got individuals who can help you find the mutations involved in these conditions, but also you can be involved with genetics counselors to, to help identify that. But what I'd make the plea for is that you get careful clinical observations and report them. Can't tell you how important that's been in my career in figuring out the genetic basis of conditions, having careful clinical observations. I think we went through a period about 20 years ago for about 10 or 15 years where the emphasis wasn't placed on it. It was uh, not placed to, of such importance, and it really is important. These are just some of the conditions I've worked with over the years, and we found gen uh, alterations in teeth that any dentist would be able to observe and pick up but are not so obvious to uh, our physician colleagues or, or geneticists on, as a whole. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about dentinogenesis imperfecta, and again along our theme of how does the genetics help us understand um, what's happening. Now dentin is made up of three primarily organic molecules, that dentin salophosphoprotein and the collagen 1A1, collagen 1A2. These are coded for on different genes. And genetic mutations of any one of these can cause dentin genesis imperfecta, or uh, abnormal uh, development of the dentin. Now, there are a number of classifications of DI, uh, DI that have developed over the years. And primarily, I, I think as we look now in, with respect to the, what genes are involved, Mutations of dentin salophosphoprotein. Dentin salophosphoprotein gene codes for a protein which is then split into two proteins that functions in, enamel, in, in dentin development and mineralization. Mutations of this gene cause isolated dentinogenesis imperfecta. However, mutations of collagen 1A1 and collagen 1A2, which are on two different chromosomes, can also cause DI. They don't have to. The collagen genes are big. There's over 50 exons in each of these genes. And over 500 mutations, different mutations have been reported. In fact, it's well in excess of that now for each of these genes. These, the phenotypic findings associated with mutations of these genes can be very variable, from a very mild phenotype 
to a, a very severe, in fact, lethal phenotype. They can include things like dentinogenesis imperfecta, short stature, hearing loss, blue sclera, mitral valve prolapse, aortic, so cardiovascular problems, bone problems, okay, fractures. The, the challenge has been in the past, somebody presented with DI. Did they have isolated DI? Was it due to a dentin sialophosphoprotein mutation? Or did they have a form of DI that had syndromic manifestations? And let me show you a case that uh, we had uh, a few years ago. So with uh, Dr. Paulos referred family members with dentinogenesis imperfecta. That was their chief complaint. We started examining family members. We found that some of them who were affected also had joint hyperextensibility, bone fractures, increased bone fractures, and they had severe joint pain. The people with DI reported this joint pain, which I don't think had been reported previously. Bottom line is we did genetic linkage studies and localized the gene to chromosome 17, so we knew it was a collagen 1A1 gene. We sequenced the gene and found a mutation in exon 32. So we had this specific mutation, and we know that this mutation is associated with dentinogenesis imperfecta. Some other clinical findings, okay? It changes a glycine to a cysteine, okay? Nucleotide G to a T. And now we have a genotype-phenotype correlation. If someone else is identified with this type mutation, they, they know what the phenotypic findings are associated with that, for instance. They don't need to go through a search or that type of thing. And the clinicians can be on the lookout for that. But having that genotype-phenotype information is critical. And I'm going to illustrate it with this example. There's another mutation of the same amino acid, same gene, same amino acid, but the next nucleotide over Glycine changes to an aspartic acid. The phenotype associated with this is neonatal lethal. It, it's very severe. And the point I'm trying to make here is although as high throughput uh, sequencing methodologies come on board, and I'll show you an example in a little bit of where it was applied, you can now sequence all the exons in somebody's genomes in about 25 hours, get the data back. Then the challenge is what, what's the information telling us? You need to have, we need to develop more robust databases of phenotypic findings with genetic alterations to, to be able to interpret these types of findings. Now with dentinogenesis imperfecta, specifically with DSPP, it was possible to sequence in the past collagen 1A1, it cost about $5,000. It's less than $1,000 now. Collagen 1A2 you could sequence, it was about $5,000, significantly less now. And for DSPP, it wasn't possible to sequence the whole gene. And what happens is there's an area of the exon 5 which is highly repetitive, and there's 200 tandem repeats of serine serine aspartic acid, okay, very hydrophilic, and it's a unique biological protein, okay? And molecularly, it just wasn't possible to sequence through this, and that was the challenge. So what happened is people would sequence the parts of DSPP they could, and then if they didn't find a mutation, reports were, well, it's not DSPP, it's gotta be another gene. No, it wasn't, we just weren't, being, we weren't sequencing the whole gene. So in about 2007, 2008, Larry Fisher and, and Dee McKnight were working with us, and they developed a technique to sequence through this highly repetitive region. What we found is for a number of cases, and now there's more uh, by now, but the, the majority of cases where we looked at, the mutations were actually in this highly repetitive region, okay? So broadly, they were, in, in broad strokes, mutations that were inside this highly repetitive region, which changed the protein, produced protein from a hydrophilic repeat to a hydrophobic repeat, which functioned very di differently, precipitated out and, and was non-functional. So we had sort of two classes of mutations. That was important for understanding etiology, and I'll show you how that's affected uh, development or, or the move to develop novel treatments in a second. But the other thing that it did is it changed clinical, the ability to clinically test for these individuals. So now if an individual presented with DI, you could go through and sequence all three of these genes and determine what the root cause was. If they had DSPP mutations, you knew this was probably the only phenotype. If they had mutations of these other genes, you may want to have a more thorough evaluation of that individual and perhaps other affected family members. So clinically, I think that was significant for diagnosis and for nosology. 
But something else we found is, you know, I, I think sort of in the past we assumed that if it was only DI and no other findings, it had to be a DSPP mutation. And here I'm showing you two cases. They're both from large families. I haven't shown the pedigree here. Large autosomal dominant families segregating dentinogenesis imperfecta was the chief complaint. We went into these fam we, we went in, in sequence and found a collagen 1A1 mutation, a novel mutation in this family, and we found a collagen 1A2 mutation is responsible for DI in this family. As we did more thorough analysis, we found that actually in this family, which is from Brazil, I'm, I'm sorry, this family's from Turkey, they had short stature. So the affected individuals compared to the population norms and even their family norms were a few inches shorter, slightly shorter. That's the only other phenotypic finding that we found. Very mild, but this is the main finding. And in this case, they had dentinogenesis imperfecta. The only other finding we could find in all affected individuals was this Wormian lamboidal suture, okay? Uh, at NIH, we were doing a lot of phenotyping, so you wouldn't normally perhaps have the opportunity to do this. But my point is that individuals with DI can have mild cases and not show other features. And there have been cases of individual in families with DI due to collagen mutations where it's variable expression. So one individual, the main finding may be DI, and, in, and not much in terms of vascular or bone findings, but in other family members that have the mutation, they have more significant, in fact, with real health consequences, uh, apart from dental, for their vasculature or bone findings. So again, I think the clinical significance isn't just developing a diagnosis in nosology, but as I mentioned before, certain individuals can have access to care. And in medicine in general, I know reimbursement patterns are different, but if you have genetic diseases, you're covered, and now it's law. You can't be discriminated against, but we need to come forward with the dental aspects of these types of traits because, as we'll see, they're not insignificant. Now, I want to mention a little bit about how understanding the etiology can help advance development of novel etiologic-based treatments. As another part of my research, we have identified genes involved in certain kidney diseases. And in fact, we found genes that causes a type of kidney disease where a protein was made that, that destroyed cells with the ascending loop of Henle. So basically, this mutant protein destroyed the kidneys over time, end-stage renal disease and death if you didn't have a transplant. But what we also found out is that mutation uh, caused it, what we would call an endoplasmic reticulum store disease. The mutant protein got clogged up in the endoplasmic reticulum and killed the cell. We're able to also use molecular chaperones to move that mutant protein out of the cell and prevent cell death. So we thought, gee, could there be correlations with certain dental diseases? And in fact, there are. So this is a case for dentinogenesis imperfecta. And what I want to show you here, could we dim the lights a little bit, please? Is it possible? No? OK. What I want to try and show here is so we have individuals. I, I showed you before the, the DSPP gene. So I'm not talking about that repetitive region of exon 5. But in, in earlier exons, 1 and 2, uh, particularly two, there are a number of mutations, and these cause problems in uh, protein folding and transport of the protein. So what we have here, normally DSPP is produced in a cell, and this shows a cell. DPS is, P is produced, and this is stained with an antibody. This is an antibody staining for the endoplasmic reticulum organelle in the, in the cells. This is an overlay, and you can see the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see the DSPP being produced by the cell and it's excreted. We could detect this in the medium uh, around in the cell culture. This is cells that have one of the mutations from DSPP. You see the DSPP is produced, but it's retained in the endoplasmic reticulum. And here, all the DSPP is in the endoplasmic reticulum. You don't see it expressed outside the cell. And what we're able to do with this uh, 4-phenylbutyrate, and also we used colchicine, so there's a number of molecular chaperones, we're able to treat these mutant cells with these chemical chaperones and actually get the mutant protein to be excreted out, okay? And that's what we show here. We show different mutations. These are different mutations of the DSPP gene. This is an empty vector. This is a wild type uh, cell with a wild type DSPP. And you can see DSPP is secreted versus in these mutants, much less, or in fact, some cases, no DSPP is secreted. When we treat them with this molecular chaperone, we can get the mutated protein secreted out. And in other studies, we're able to demonstrate we, in fact, uh, increase the longevity of the cells, okay? So the cells, instead of going through apoptosis and dying, we're able to, to keep them 
healthy and functional. So what I want to point out is through understanding the molecular defect, you can open up the caveat of perhaps novel developmental treatments, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. And in cancer genetics, uh, uh, cancer genetics has been applied to companion testing, and you may or may not know, but for certain specific types of cancer, particular epithelial types of cancer, solid tumors, based on the genetic mutation, you can be tested, and if you have that mutation, you can have very, very, very high success rates for treatments. It, it's amazing. So again, the treatment doesn't work for, for uh, certain types of cancers. It doesn't work for, say, colon cancer. It will work for everybody with colon cancer, but for certain types of cancer based on the genetic ideology, you can have specific treatments that are very, very successful. I think it's a real paradigm for healthcare in general. Now, I want to end up talking a little bit about, and this is sort of going through a, a think type part of the talk, what's the future? We're, we're getting genetic information, as I mentioned, uh, you know, more than 8,000 conditions. And daily, the genes involved in some of these Mendelian types of conditions are being identified. So how are we going to use this information? Well, I want to mention, first of all, as I mentioned, we were talking in the past, we've been talking really pretty gene-centric type genetic analysis. As a result of some of the big science projects that I mentioned, we're understanding more and more that genomic, uh, the, uh, the, the range of genomic and genetic determinants of phenotype. So it's not just mutations of coding regions of genes that cause disease. And in fact, uh, one of the biggest findings is that while only about 2% of the genome codes for genes that code for proteins, uh, the rest of the DNA in my training was called junk DNA as a term. Uh, biology doesn't carry a lot of junk. There's a cost of doing that ATP energy and things. So it pro probably wasn't junk. We just didn't understand how it functioned. Now we're really understanding, I'd say, as a field, how it's functioning much more. And those big science projects that I mentioned, 80% of the genome that was pre previously thought to be relatively inert is now realized to be critical and play a role in regulation of gene expression. And additionally, a large percentage, the majority of that expresses RNA. So that central dogma that I mentioned, DNA goes to RNA to protein, perhaps in the majority of cases, is the exception to the rule, okay? In most cases, DNA produces RNA, which functions, okay? And understanding that, I think, is going to be the basis for understanding truly pathways of development of normal and abnormal uh, health and disease. And there's a number of regulatory regions, you know, chromosome structure, regulatory regions, and other types of RNAs. Um, these link RNAs are what came out in September from the ENCO project where there was a thousand genes involved in, in they're called link genes. They regulate pathways of development. And uh, we just didn't know about that before. So incorporating this new information to understanding is going to make, I think, a large difference. But we need to consider in terms of the uh, genetics and healthcare, what are the public ramifications, public health ramifications of genetics on healthcare? And to do that, we need to consider the relative contribution of genetic factors to disease. And a genetic contribution to a disease can be large or can be small, okay? And let's just talk a little bit and think about this for a second. So we talk about phenotypic variation. Virtually any phenotype that occurs on the basic human condition is a result of the interaction of that individual's genes with other genes that they have, their genetic makeup, and their genetic makeup with the environment, okay? Now, many, many, many studies, the GWAS studies, deep sequencing studies, have actually evaluated height. And it makes sense because height is pretty easy, a pretty cheap phenotype to get. You can measure it fairly accurately, pretty accurately, quickly, low cost. So what I'm getting at is there's probably more genetic data dealing with height than perhaps any other phenotype. Now, we have the individuals in this room. This is enough. If you generally have about 100 people, if you line individuals up according to their height, if we, if we all lined up according to height, we'd be pretty much, I would bet, in a normal distribution, bell-shaped distribution. Average would probably be about 66 inches. A number of people would be gradually shorter, a number of people taller. As you go out multiple standard deviations, you'd get a range from a little over four feet to a little over under seven feet. Okay, that, that should, I say in the, in the large studies. But this is the phenotypic variation we're talking about. And these are, you know, down here in, in the tails. Most people are around the range. Now, we used to believe that 
the gene, there were about eight to 20 gene loci maybe contributing to height and determining height. You know, we all get enough sun, we get enough nutrients, so the environmental factors probably aren't as significant as they were historically uh, in, in determining extremes of height. But um, now as a result of these big science projects, the estimates are, and for height for instance, it's not eight to, to 20 genes, it's hundreds, about 500 to 1,000 gene loci contribute. They, they each contribute very small amounts to the total phenotype, okay? And this seems to be a paradigm for complex diseases, that many, many more genes are contributing to them than we thought. And this same sort of comparison I think holds up, we could look at this as chronic periodontitis, and then as I'll show you in a second, we could look at Mendelian forms of disease like papillon Lefevre syndrome. Now if we were to look at a larger population sample, say the city of Chicago, you would find that individuals within the population, you get outside of this distribution some real extremes. Some people are very short with dwarfism of different types. And some people, there's different forms of giantism. So you get real extremes, very rare. But these cases are caused by mutations of genes. So a single gene mutation, if you have a fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 mutation, certain types of mutations, you will be an achondroplastic dwarf, okay? It doesn't matter really what you eat or your other genetic complement, you're gonna be, that one gene mutation overrides all other developmental pathway in regards to height. Similarly for giantism. So we have this paradigm, and I think it's holding up, it looks like it'll hold up for disease as well. When you think about disease and contribution of genes, you need to think there's the most common form of genes, diseases in a population are due to many, many genes, each of small effect. But there are rarer forms of disease which are Mendelian types of traits. Now the Mendelian traits can help us identify what the key players are in the developmental pathways, okay? So we talk about classification of genetic diseases, and I'm not getting into microRNAs and a number of different, or methylation, a number of different mechanisms, but to say globally, there, you can look at it, say, three forms of genetic disorders. Single gene disorders, AIDI, as we've discussed, where a mutation of a single gene is really deterministic of the phenotype, chromosome disorders, and then complex genetic diseases. And I'm gonna just illustrate some of those in a little bit, particularly the chromosome disorders. You may or may not be aware of some developments with those. So we mentioned uh, single gene disorders, AIDI. These follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance, and they reflect the deterministic effect of a particular gene mutation on the development of those tissues, okay? They're simple traits. They're uncommon in terms of frequency on a population level, although they can be very common in a family. 50% of individuals can be affected, okay? When we talk about chromosome disorders, most of us in, in genetics are familiar with the trisomies. Trisomy 21, Down syndrome, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, somewhat less compatible with life. Also monosomies, Turner syndrome, XO. But there's actually, when we look at, now as we're able to sequence DNA in a much more refined manner, I mentioned the uh, 8,000 genetic conditions there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genetic conditions that are due to contiguous gene syndromes, okay? These are due to deletions or duplications of contiguous regions of DNA, okay? And in fact, as we're able to really interrogate chromosomes in a much more refined manner, all of us have chromosome anomalies, okay? The question is what the phenotypic effect? Think about it, if you had a, a chromosome uh, deletion You'd have two chromosomes, say from your father's chromosome you inherited, say for uh, an MMP20 mutation, which is normally a recessive mutation for AI. If you had a deletion of one allele, if you just had one copy of the uh, mutation, that's gonna manifest. So sometimes deletions uncover recessive conditions, okay? Deletions or duplications can alter methylation patterns that can affect development. But the point is here, as we're able to interrogate these, and a number of studies are now identifying individuals overlapping regions of chromosomal changes, and you get variable clinical findings, depending on the genes involved, which genes are deleted, which genes are duplicated, okay? What I'm trying to show here is historically we've done gene sequencing and uh, a number of us have spent many hours analyzing data like this going through really uh, virtually manually. Now with the high throughput methodologies and the methods to analyze these data, 
we're able to identify copy number variants, deletions, duplications in a much more refined and much quicker manner. And what is being found is that there's, as I said, all of us have some chromosomal anomalies. There's quite an extensive array of chromosome deletions, duplications, inversions, which will affect regulatory regions, insertions, and translocations. And as genetics, the, the cost of doing genetics decreases, and individuals have this type of information, they're going to say, what's the consequence? And again, that's what I mentioned. We need to really start, or not start, we need to continue with our genotype-phenotype correlations so that as people have this genetic information, we can determine what it means. This is just as a periodontist. These are two cases I've seen over the last few years that had chromosomal changes. So they presented with hereditary gingival overgrowth and then with overgrowth with anomalies of eruption. But I'm performing genetic analysis, was able to determine there's nothing wrong with the proteins, there's nothing wrong with the proteins produced by these individuals uh, in terms of structurally. In one case, the channel membrane protein, they, they produce 500 times the amount that they should normally in gingiva, and in another they produce, it's a hapless insufficiency, they produce about 50% of the normal amount. So again, I think this is what's going to be coming in PATH reports in the future. We need to think about how we're going to integrate that. I'm just going to briefly mention complex genetic disorders. I mentioned these. These are the most common health problems, okay, due to things, uh, responsible for things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, forms of diabetes, obesity. In dentistry, we can think of chronic periodontitis caries. They're due to multiple genes, gene environment effects. And the important thing is in these, what we're realizing is in, in complex diseases, is that hundreds to thousands of genes are going to be involved. And the contribution of the maximal contribution for these, Mende these complex traits is going to be in the order of about 0.5%. That's the maximum contribution of a locus. So you're going to understand, have to understand a lot more than we currently do. And understanding one genetic SNP, for instance, for some of these complex diseases just doesn't help us clinically at this point in time. I mentioned ENCODE and uh, uh, just how that has changed our understanding. I'd encourage you to just look up the ENCODE that came out with 30 coordinated papers last month. And as I say, it's amazing and really changing our understanding. And incorporation of that data with some other projects has really led to a change of our understanding of complex diseases in that many, many, many more genes are, gonna, are involved with smaller effect than we thought. So in the last few minutes, I just want to finish up by talking about how we're thinking about genetics and public health. We talked about diagnostics, etiology, but in terms of intervention strategies, I mentioned that many conditions and the genes for these are starting to be identified, okay? How are we going to use this information? To put this in perspective, I pulled this out. This was published last week, October 3rd, Science Translational Medicine, and in a nutshell, and a neonatal intensive care unit where a significant number of admissions are due to genetic diseases of unknown cause. This is a, these are five cases where babies were brought in, didn't know what they had. Their genomes were sequenced in 25 hours, read in another 25 hours, okay? So for 50 hours to take in the DNA, sequencing the genome, analyzing it, cost is about $13,500 per child. You know, cost is continually going down, but this is a rush and they were able to identify the genetic basis of four of the five conditions, okay? So this is really coming. The, the pressures are coming here. Of course, this is a neonatal intensive care unit, but um, this is going to start to pervade healthcare and dentistry, I think. So when we think about going back to that human genome sort of project, we've got a disease with a genetic component. You can identify the genes, and those can be mapped by a variety of methods, linkage, association, these types of things. We can use these to develop diagnostics, to develop better classification systems. And understanding the classification systems, diagnostics can be used to really develop a nosology that can then be used as the basis for developing interventions, okay? And I'm not going into the different treatments, but there's a variety, depending small molecules to turn on and off genes, replacement uh, therapies, gene therapies, behavioral uh, genetic therapies are going to be important. But we need to start thinking about the future as dental clinicians. And I want to say, so if you look at healthcare and, and the human condition and public health, for, for millennia, infectious diseases caused most significant morbidity and mortality in human beings, okay? Uh, I'm, a, I'm acutely aware of this. My mother suffered from polio in New York as a child, and she was saying how it was a really terrifying thing for them, and she was paralyzed for a while. But so at different cases, this is over the years, 
prevalence of some of these viral conditions. And you can see how by late 1990s, these were virtually eliminated in the US. Tremendous public health uh, success story based on understanding the etiology and developing um, strategies to prevent uh, the infectious agents manifesting. Take a new example. Some of you in the room will, be from, will remember the advent of HIV or AIDS. When it was first occurring, we didn't know what caused it. We didn't have treatments. And we were really looking at tertiary intervention, thrush, uh, other type of lesions in the ca oral cavity and elsewhere. Um, as we understood that HIV was the infectious agent, I can remember the first patients coming in on double protease inhibitors and thinking, boy, you look healthy. You know what I mean? You've been so sick before, now I can't believe it. So understanding what caused the disease led to secondary prevention. Of course, the ultimate goal is primary prevention, preventing people being infected. When we think about genetics, we need to think from a public health perspective, OK, let's look at Mendelian traits. In a sense, the advantage is they're easy to identify. Take a specific mutation. You can identify what the mutation is now. But we're right now really between tertiary. We're still at tertiary prevention in these genetic diseases, as we'll hear later in the day. And I'm not knocking tertiary prevention. But we need to move towards understanding the basis, the biological pathways, which was, Jim will talk about, so we can develop treatments based on not just secondary prevention, but primary prevention. Those may be ways by understanding these RNA regulatory mechanisms of turning off expression of mutant genes and that type of thing to manifest normal development. When we think about complex diseases now with the uh, recent uh, understanding of ENCODE and these other projects, it's going to require more understanding, OK? I used to think that since we understand, uh, if we can understand, they have such small effect, if we can identify the genes and their interactions, we can modify or overcome their effects. But since the effects are so small and so many genes ap appear to be involved, I think it's going to take a much deeper understanding of health and development to be able to uh, bring public health uh, prevention and treatment to uh, these complex genetic diseases. I wanted to uh, thank some of my uh, colleagues. Obviously, you can't do uh, some of the work we've done without a lot of great collaborators. And these are some of the individuals at NIH uh, in Brazil, Boston, and in Turkey, North Carolina, and in Israel who have participated. And I want to thank the NIH for their uh, support over the years. Thank you.